that I would have given. So I would say in summary, uh, and uh, Bob, uh, WNN and JIB, JIB touched on it, the cost of manufacturing in the country in which the manufacturing occurs, and uh, also uh, Deming, who was an interesting case study that I studied a long time ago, uh, just as an example, who did remarkable things with assembly line production of everything in Japan, and their economy just skyrocketed. And when he tried the same approach in, uh, in Detroit with the, with the big three car manufacturers, they just ho-hummed him right out of the room. And uh, as, a, as a result of that, it, 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 ignoring Deming and wanting to go on with the old ways, the Japanese car market just took over. And I think we can see the same thing with the Japanese radio market, um, electronics market, and a whole bunch of other things. So that's part of the reason. And I think the other reason, as we've seen in, in our you know fairly recent lifetime, with the rapid uh, progress of the technology of the Internet and online vendors and ability to buy things online without having to call somebody on the phone. You know, uh, this is the way business is done. I would say the other reason they called it caused the uh, the demise of 50 single sideband radio companies and uh, possibly the transistor, don't really know for sure, um, is the failure to adapt to new technology. And we have seen since the early 1990s when the internet started to grow and become popular and big companies, I'll just pick on one, Barnes and Noble, and there have been many others, who did not adapt to the new e-commerce or internet commerce went under. And uh, I think Sears and Roebuck was another one. They Maybe they just poo-pooed it in their management meetings or whatever, but it was those who embraced the new upcoming technology that came up on top. And I think ham radio and commercial radio and other electronics, vintage single sideband, uh, all of it is a couple of those things, having the benefit of the low cost of manufacturing in a, in a country not in the U.S., and failure to adapt to new technology. I think I think that's, that, that's the common ground. And so that's just a summary, I guess, of what other people were saying, and, that, and I agree with that. And let's see, I had one other note here. Oh, somebody in the early was talking about margaritas. And uh, I will say I'm a margarita fan, and in my house here in Darwin, it came with a, a very large and mature prickly pear cactus plant right in the southwest side of the house. And when that beautiful plant bears prickly pear fruit, um, there's nothing better than to you gotta wear gloves because of the thorns. Grab those prickly pear fruits off when they're ripe or pick them up off the ground where they're even more ripe. Throw them on the barbecue for a few minutes to burn off the thorns and then bring them in the kitchen and skin them. Uh, put them in the blender, and that is that makes for a fabulous Darwin prickly pear margarita. And that's all I'll say about that. Um, so over to you, Bob. What do you have to say on the subject? AK6R in the group, KJ6HN. Yeah, KJ6HN in the group from AK6R. Well, you know, Max, I think we ought to have a topic uh, called the Hot What's the Best Margarita a Recipe for Vintage Sideband uh, People. <laughs> I enjoyed that very much. Uh, in fact, uh, I have had Mark's margaritas over at uh, John K6KOI's house a couple of years ago, and uh, I, I do have to attest they are absolutely wonderful. But uh, that would be a great question we should ask. What's the best margarita uh, recipe that people know, and we can compare notes on that too. Anyway, tonight we're running the uh, TSA 30 FG. Uh, the gold version and going into a commander a linear amplifier running a full legal limit into a Delamar engineer's off center fed up about 30 uh, antenna up about uh, 35 feet and it's driven by a hand mic I have actually have a Kenwood noise canceling hand mic uh, that we're using right now and uh, seems to be doing a pretty good job Tentec so model 150A uh, converted uh, to VFO to control Pete here, and N6QW. Thank you again, Mark. Good to hear you again. And also, uh, thanks to Larry for the uh, good question. It seems to have struck a, a nerve with a lot of different uh, people here in terms of answers. Uh, I don't know whether it was the KWM one or the
the towers on the phone, or maybe it was one of the uh, World War II uh, walkie-talkies that was the first transistor, but or the first uh, transceiver, but it's an interesting topic. I, I do have one comment, and that is when I was, when I was going to uh, a school in Berkeley in uh, the 1960s, mid-1960s, uh, in electrical engineering school, about half of the class was from Japan in the electrical engineering classes. All, of, all the, the beginning classes in physics and everything else, and their their whole goal in that, in that, at that time was to go back to Japan and start industry. And in fact, I know a few of them who I've kept in touch with, they actually went back and started uh, uh, electronic uh, companies, and their whole goal was to be in the United States. And we were, at that time, we were just phasing out uh, uh, teaching uh, vacuum tubes and we were doing uh, transistors, germanium, and otherwise, as well as op amps, and uh, also uh, just a, a real vintage cool single sideband that 75 meters for, uh, for digital electronics, uh, BCD readouts, that type of stuff. And uh, they they took all that, they took it down, they always got A's on all their tests, and then they went back to Japan and took that technology and created some great companies. But uh, it was quite a quite an interesting experience to go to school with them and to see their dedication and I think that followed through with a lot of the uh, uh, the companies that they founded and uh, and uh, beat, beat our pants off in terms of some of the electronics and stuff. A few comments, uh, I'll just tell you what my first transceiver was and that was a East Kid Tour. I had that 1963. It was a Super Regen and to me that was uh, that was, the, that was the transceiver that I remember the best. I had more fun with that little transceiver, and I think I was about 14 or 15 years old, and I was talking to people all the way up and down the coast of uh, California, crystal controlled on 145.35, so that's, uh, that's where I, uh, I'm coming from. Okay, let's see what else. Uh, oh, a couple things. I, uh, I've been reading the, uh, the email list, and uh, Larry was talking about a knob collection that he had. I also have a huge knob collection here, probably uh, maybe a couple thousand different uh, knobs uh, from all different types of vintage radios that I have acquired over the years uh, from different estate sales and stuff. So if you're looking for a particular one or if you want to come over and, and scratch through the many boxes that I have because you're looking for a tuner uh, a knob or something else, uh, just give me a call or drop me a, an email at ak6r at yahoo.com and I'll be glad to uh, set up a time when you can uh, when you can come and see it. Uh, the other transceiver, I'm just looking at my notes here, the other transceiver that I remember the most, of course, is the old Swan. They were all done here locally. And in fact, one of the techs that works for me was one of the original uh, tech, uh, techs who, uh, who worked for Swan. And uh, he still uh, has some stories about some of the prototypes that Swan actually came out, or actually designed, but they never hit the market. And uh, quite some really quite unique ones with uh, with uh, uh, digital readouts and stuff. So interesting technology there, interesting history. All right, let's turn it over to Mike K6ZSR, see how he can enlighten us, and uh, we'll take it from there. K6ZSR. Go ahead and give us your wisdom from AK6R. Okay, Bob. <laughs> AK6R and the group K6ZSR. Mike here in uh, kind of downtown Santa Barbara, sort of. But anyway, uh, good evening to everybody and uh, uh, beautiful conditions tonight. Every, everybody sounds great, and I think we got a good uh, question. By the way, Mark. Uh, Larry, W6WH, is probably the most prolific. Well, him and uh, Bob, J-I-B, J-I-B and uh, W-U-H are probably the most prolific uh, supporters of the question of the evening. It's almost uh, like I get them every week. Uh, both of those guys come up with these ideas. I don't know where they get them, but they're great. So keep them coming, fellas. Okay, so uh, tonight uh, I'm running... Uh, a Swan 500 CX, just a simple Swan that's going up into my dwarf tree and in inverted V. And hopefully, if the uh, if the winds calm down uh, 
uh, towards the weekend, probably Saturday, I'm going to get the bazooka and send it over the 100-foot tree and hopefully uh, get the rail inverted me up there into the palm tree. Uh, but anyway, I've been getting good reports. Actually, I'm this low-lying uh, guy here, only about 17, uh, 18 foot off the ground inverted me. Arduino SI5351.